Okay, good morning everyone and welcome along. We're about to start uh, this morning and i um, just checking the time right. So excuse me down the back there, we're about to start now. Thank you very much. So just a little reminder about the practical things for those members of the public who are here this morning. Please make sure your cell phones are off. Um, and that um, you allow the submitters their time to talk without talking in the, in the back rows, as they say. We can hear it up here, so um, that would be appreciated. And the other thing is, just to remind everyone, we're keeping strictly to time. Very important that we do that. So that means that the time allocated for submissions is your total time, including questions. And, uh, and we're um, rigorously enforcing that. So have a think about that with your presentation to allow time for councillors to have questions um, you might want to leave a few minutes at the end um, of the time allotted to you. All right, I think we're going to be beamed in this morning, are we? So, councillors, this is um, where Jacob has to relay any questions because he's uh, on the microphone. So if you have questions after this presentation, this is from Paul Connett. The video's not working, just audio. Oh, or only audio's working. So we've got no pictures. Um, and he's coming in from the United States, is he? Bulgaria, goodness me. It's one o'clock in the morning. Oh, gosh. We've tested it this morning, but it's got a slight delay on the Right. Yeah, Yes, that's right. So we're just going for audio. Well, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Um, so modern technology, that's great. So uh, he's uh, got 10 minutes and um, 15. Oh, okay, good. He's got 15 minutes. All right, good to go. Might have been picked up, Councillor Henbury. <laughs> Hello. Good morning, Paul. This is Jacob Quinn from Hamilton City Council. Um, good morning in Bulgaria. Can you hear me? I can indeed, Gary. Great. Your, your time starts now. I'll let you know when you're at the 10-minute mark. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, dear council members, thank you for allowing me to testify before you using Skype. I apologise that the video is not just hear me, you can't see me, and I can't see you, unfortunately. However, I should point out that my name is Paul Connett, that you know. Um, I have just lost my uh, Sorry. I have studied the fluoridation issue for 17 years, first as a professor of chemistry specializing in environmental chemistry and toxicology. Action Network. In October of 2012, with two other scientists, I published the book, The Case Against Fluoride. Every argument is supported with references to the primary scientific literature at all. Two years ago, I testified before the Ministry of New Zealand Ministry of Health. About 20 people attended that meeting. I presented documents outlined in the book and asked them to respond in writing. Years, they have failed to do so. In my view, fluoridation should never have started. It should never use the public water supply to deliver medicine, any medicine. You cannot control who gets the medicine. Everyone, regardless of age, medical status, or nutrition status, it's the I'm just wondering the, um, so I think what we'll do is we'll just stop for a moment and we'll see if we can get a better reconnection. Paul, we're just going to put you on hold for a moment. Um, we're, the connection is um, somewhat disconnecting, so we're going to call you back. Yes, I'm wondering if it might be better on the phone, yeah. I'm just mindful it's one o'clock in the morning and he will have stayed up to, to do this call. Um.
I mean, technically speaking, um, coming in through the internet should be clearer than coming through telephone, but Bulgaria, I'm not so sure what, what the situation is with Bulgarian um, technology. I know from my experience in nearby Kosovo that the internet was um, not very strong. even. No, I, I, I would suspect that. I remember being in Croatia and you had to wander around on the mountains to get reception. <laughs> mm. Don't do video call, just do that call. I mean, the good thing is that we do have, um, we have um, had Paul Connop before, which is very good, and we have his submission, so. <coughs> Paul, um, please feel free to resume. Um, we just had a connection problem. Uh, I think I've said, um, as I've said, that using the power supply to be able to add ID. But there are extra reasons it shouldn't be added more to the water. It's not working. It's not working, no. So what I think we might do, um, and I'm mindful of the time over there, People. perhaps offline you might just want to just make some telephone calls with him and just see what we can do. But I'll, I'll Follow it. Keep moving. On the other hand, there are many biological processes in the body that are harmed by fluoride. The, the level of fluoride added is not small, contrary to what you're told. The average level used in New Zealand is 0.85 parts per million. And this is about 200 times the level that is found in mother's milk in non-fluoridated communities, which is average 0 0.004 parts per million. In my view, it is reckless to bottle feed a baby using fluoridated water uh, with all its sensitive to de developing tissues in play at levels of fluoride 200 times the level in mother's milk. Uh, what does nature know about the baby's needs that the American Dental Association and other dental bodies seem uh, not to know? Uh, fluoridation is a most unusual practice. The vast majority of the world's population is not forced to drink fluoridated water, including Okay, so what we're going to do is, um, I mean, that's not, not, it's just not satisfactory. Um, so can you have some conversations offline with him and decide how you want to proceed with that? I suspect it is his location in the world. So we'll carry on. Um, and the next submitter is, uh, yes. There's an option that even if something's recorded and paid to that's us. Right, paid to, yeah. yeah. So we'll leave it to you guys to sort, sort out how you're going to do that. Okay, so the next um, person is Frank Rosen. Have I got that name right? And uh, Frank is speaking on behalf of Heather Smith. Have we got Frank? Yeah. Come on up, Frank. So, um, Frank, we've allocated you 10 minutes in pleading questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bulgaria one minute, mutter mutter the next. Oh, wait. Um, my name's Frank Rosen. I'm a veterinarian from Mata Mata. Uh, I've been a vet for 50 years. My history is as a vet. I'm also, and during that time, of course, I've been uh, uh, reading and critiquing scientific papers and acting on the decisions that I make from those papers. I'm a member of Physicians and Scientists for Global Responsibility. I'm now work as a uh, farm, farm performance consultant because of my expertise in soil, plant science, and animal, and I do uh, consulting in um, 
in those, those fields. I also do, I'm a health advocate because of my uh, expertise in various aspects of human nutrition, including specifically uh, calcium and magnesium and vitamin D. And I will get to the, that later. Um, I'm also an organic gardener. I don't use uh, water supplies from the uh, from the uh, the public water supplies because of the chlorine content, which doesn't do the plants any good or the soils any good. Uh, and uh, fluoride acts in the same way. I'm also uh, for the last well not for, the last, for over that time of several years I was a member of the uh, International Fluoride Research um, Association and reading the fluoride research. Uh, magazine which contains most of the scientific papers that you get on fluoride around the world. Um, several years ago, about 10 years ago, I was one of uh, several people that were in that uh, persuaded Matamata Piaco District Council to take fluoride out of the out of the water supply. And it's still out of it. It's still we took it out, got it taken out and it's still out. Um, with no untoward effects. During the, since that time, when we were doing that, there were two things. There were no health, in, no, there were no health um, directions on a tube of toothpaste, and there was nothing about not using fluoridated water for infant formula. Why has our, why has that changed? They're coming to they're coming to grips with the situation that fluoride is fluoridated water is not a good thing. What is fluoride? Fluoride has been defined as the FDA, Federal Drug Agency in the States, which governs a lot of these things, much to our um, dismay sometimes. Fluoride is not a mineral nutrient. It is a prescription drug and has never received FDA approval and does not meet the legal requirements of safety and effectiveness for such approval. All right. Now that is their definition. It's a drug. It's not a, a nutrient, not an essential nutrient. And what is it that we use? It is not sodium fluoride. It is not the stuff that you use for water for fluoridation of water is it's made up of fluoro hydrofluorosilicic acid, which comes from the process of making superphosphate phosphate acid phosphate uh, fertilizers from their base um, phosphate rock. They can't what they do. Uh, in the process, the stuff comes out which they, they're not allowed to, uh, the uh, waste product is not allowed to go into the water, it's not allowed to go into the atmosphere. So what do they do with it? They, ha they scrub it, and that means they spray the water, as the stuff goes up the chimney, they spray it with water. What comes down is what is you, you, are, you, that you are using to put in the water. And in that thing, and to, be, to ex um, excuse the expression, but it's crap. It's absolutely disgusting stuff, right? It is contains not only contains fluoride in that hydro, uh, hydrofluorosilicic acid, it also contains lead, it contains arsenic, it contains mercury, and all those are in, in there, and they are very toxic, as is fluoride itself. Um, the other one is cadmium. I don't know whether you noticed in the last few, last few weeks there's been uh, problems with cadmium in meat. Well, it's been for a few years, actually, but it cropped up recently in pr meat products. Where does that come from? That comes from the, uh, the, the uh, superphosphates, which goes onto the land, which goes through the thing, because animals eat soil. It doesn't get into the plant very much, but it gets into the soil, and that goes through the system, and cadmium is a, another toxic thing. And that is the, in the stuff that you put in the water. It's disgusting, and it's toxic. They, um, now, what does it do, or what is it supposed to do? They, the proponents will tell you that it, it, um, it, is, it cures caries. 
rotten teeth, well, caries specifically. So caries is caused by a streptococcal bug, and fluoride kills that bug. But it also kills the many, the trillions, billions of bugs that you've got in your system. We have 10 to the 14th bugs in our gut, from our mouth to our anus, right? And every one of those is susceptible to fluoride. So not only are you, when you're using water in, in fluoride in the water, in the, in, in the mouth to kill those, those bugs, it kills a hell of a lot more. And that is the cause of the toxic, a lot of the toxicity due to fluoride, all right? It kills things. That's why it's in, it's, that's why it's in sarin, that's why it's in 1080. That, the, the active, the toxic agent in those two is fluoride, okay? What does it do? That's what it's supposed to, it's supposed to cure caries. And the, uh, there is not one reliable piece of evidence to say that fluoride cures caries, that they are, you're better off from caries by doing that. It does not do that. It kills things. Shoot! Oh my God! All right. Um, the other way, the other way it works is because it holds on to the, the fluoride, fluorine itself. The atom will hold on to anything, and particularly in calcium and magnesium, both of which are essential for bone formation. And as a veterinarian, uh, I can get, put you in touch with a website which shows you just exactly what fluoridated water does to horses. All right. They. It, it, it takes up, it, it binds onto the magnesium, and, it bind, and we've also, at the moment, we've got, since, since World War II, we've got reduced levels of that, of, of magnesium and calcium in our, among, and, and everything else. 75% is the figure quoted for magnesium in carrots. I've got it here if you want to see it. They, and these are figures from the uh, MAF in UK and the uh, Agriculture Department in the States. Since... Then, so we've got reduced amounts of magnesium and calcium going into the system. You get something like fluoride coming along, and that binds it all up. It's not available to the, to the animal. It goes into the it goes into the bones as as the form of um, it goes into calcium fluoroapatite. The apatite that is formed normally with your teeth is actually straight out uh, hexa, uh, apatite, and that the fluorosis in teeth is what. What you see is the actual formation of calcium fluoro appetite, which is not as strong as the normal appetite formation. And with the case, it does the same thing with magnesium, and uh, it also stops magnesium forming a sort of a glue which holds the bones together. That does not happen when you've got, when you've got magnesium bound up with fluoride. So, uh, therefore, the bones are weaker. They say that they, you, you, they, they, there's no evidence of it. The, the reason for that is because you can't pick it up by x-rays. It's, it's a special something like an um, MRI scan you have to do to actually fit, to um, bring up the fissures, the, the weaknesses in the bones that, um, that, that is caused by these rays. The bones are weakened. And that is why we are now seeing in New Zealand here Cow, uh, incidences of cows with broken legs. They break the forearm, the big bone, in, which is one of the biggest bones in the body, and it just, they just fall over, they broke their bones. Because, and I'm, they, there are bones sitting down in Massey University waiting to be for the money to get the research to follow this through. But I'm, uh, my research at the moment is that fluoride, that formation of fluoride, because the animals get it from eating the soil, they, they can eat up to 10% of their intake. By uh, it from soil, um, and that contains the fluoride. If you, every ton of superphosphate that goes on will will provide will provide forty kilograms per hectare of fluoride. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. So you, your ten minutes is actually up. So I'm just going to take one question from Councillor Voss, um, and that, that's all we'll have time for. Uh, the um, I have a small property which I have animals on. Yep. Um, yearlings and they um, on, on trickle feed. So the trickle feed comes from Hamilton, oh. goes into my water tank, is obviously diluted because rainwater goes in there as well, mm -hmm. and my stock drink it. Mm -hmm. I've tried to check my cows for, for um, ferocious on their teeth, but 
I, I can't find any. Mm -hmm. But what other has has any tests been done on animals that that drink fluoridated water um, to see uh, what the if there is any problems? I there's no, there's no test been been. Well, yes, there are. If you uh, if you speak to me afterwards during the break, I'll give you uh, two two websites, mm -hmm. which was in the Fluoride Research Magazine, which was about the ex the experiences of a, a woman in who had a a horse study in America, and she took out and she moved to a place where they had fluoridated water, and it shows you that. And they did test. You can the only way you test you can do is actually test the bones. If you send them to the works, you the animals and get the the uh, bones tested, you'll see the increase in fluoride in the bone. That's where it, that's where it is. Clinical signs, you get the clinical signs in oh, okay. uh, when, okay. when we laughed Sorry, about rear pain. We do have to keep strictly time, but can yep. I suggest that you give that information to the committee secretary because all of the councils I think will be interested in receiving that information okay. in terms of the animals. Yep. So thank you for coming along. Yep. I think you're the first vet we've had presenting, so thank you for for doing yep. that. Okay, the next um, speaker is Rob Hamill, and uh, Rob is speaking on behalf of Moira Turner. Hello, Rob. How are you? Welcome along. So, Rob, you've got ten minutes, and that does include questions, and we do need to keep strictly to the time. So. Oh, I think I'll use that. No, uh, well, I won't use that, so I don't right. think we'll have any problems. Um, kia ora koutou. Greetings, uh, Your Worship, councillors. Thank you for the time, and thank you for um, putting this tribunal together. Um, I, I'm not going to go into the efficacy of fluoride in the water. I'm not going to go into the scientific side of things, and I think you've already had enough of that from the, the experts. Um, and I think there will be some more today anyway. Um, look, I just really want to focus on one area, and that is dosage. And uh, from my perspective, I used to be an athlete, um, and when I was training, um, preparing for the Olympics and what have you, um, the dosage I would have been ingesting, um, I, well, I just don't know what it was. Um, and um, nowadays, I, if I'm not training or doing anything active, I'm drinking a couple, maybe three or four glasses of water a day. Um, back when I was training, I was probably drinking Oh, gosh, anywhere from five to eight litres a day. And um, <clears throat> I think for anyone who's an athlete now, my wife's an athlete now, um, we, um, seven years ago, was it eight years ago, the referendum was held um, by council? It was roughly seven or eight years ago on where the water should be fluoridated. And unfortunately, it came back with a, a, a yes. It was, what was the ratio? Can anyone tell me 60, 40, 70, 30? <coughs> and at that time, um, we were having, we had a child, a young baby, um, we um, decided to shift out of Hamilton. Um, as a, it was one of our, there were several reasons, but that was one of the major reasons we actually shifted out of Hamilton City. And I, I mean, that was not an easy decision to make um, because we had a young child and we couldn't think of any other way other than perhaps catching rainwater um, to feed our child um, non-fluoridated uh, water, not really, re not really understanding if the uh, uh, fluoride removal uh, systems you can purchase would be that effective. Um, so that's about it. I, I have real concerns about um, the um, dosage that babies are getting. You heard uh, Paul Connett talk about 200 times the amount of fluoride in water that is in uh, mother's breast milk. Um, that for me is just, there's debate over. You know, why can the precautionary principle not kick in at this point? We're talking about babies here. The precautionary principle must surely be considered the number one issue here, the precautionary principle. <coughs> and I guess the solution, you know that, do you know that, um, that feeling you get when you're in the middle of a, an argument and you realise that you're wrong? <coughs> it's an awful feeling, isn't it? And I actually have to say that some people at the, um, at the DHB, I reckon there'll be people in the DHB and perhaps in council who have held a pro view of retaining flu fluoride in the water will be thinking, oh, I might be wrong. <clears throat> and it's a difficult process to go through, isn't it, psychologically, to actually change your tack. You kind of you want to save face, but for the DHB in particular, and all that historical stuff, that historical stuff, and, the, and of course then there's the reality of can we trust the DHB for other decisions that they're making on behalf of our health? Well... They're just going to have to tough it out and, uh, and uh, take it on the chin. Because the reality is I, I think it should be removed. Our choices are being taken away. Um, it's a medication. We're being mass medicated, and I'd like to think we could make the right decision. Thanks.
No, there's no questions for you, Rob, so thank you very much for coming thank along. You. Well done. Right, the next speaker is uh, Michael Godfrey. Okay, so Michael, um, you're good to go. Thank you. So Michael, we've got 10 minutes and plenty of questions for you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, first of all, um, you have my commiserations for having to sit through this ordeal. Um, have a thought for us, though, that over the last 25, 35 years or so have been battling bureaucracy and commercial interests because we've spent a huge amount of time, effort and money in trying to get the truth out regarding fluoridation. I was involved 25 years ago in getting it out of Tauranga. And strangely enough, there hasn't been a huge increase in dental costs as forecast here six years ago by Mr. Ludbrook of the Waikato District Health Board. Um, warning there'd be a huge increase in children's decay. It hasn't occurred in Tauranga. Could it be because dental decay is not a fluoride deficiency disease. And I think by now you'll know that it's due to sugar, and it's sugar in the blood, in fact. And that's been proven by dental research by a professor um, in, in California who showed this in the 1960s. It's been widely promoted, and still is, as 25% dental decay, reduction in dental decay, even 40 to 50% by a previous Minister of Health, uh, Nick King, who was an ex-dental nurse. But this is actually in real terms, as proven by dental research, trying to show that fluoride prevents dental decay in children, and then the latest one that came out in Australia Slade and Spencer just this year where they've had it for 45 years so they've done lifetime exposure and they've managed to show one filling and we saw, we saw that presented yesterday it's only one filling a lifetime exposure over the years there's been official requests for research into the safety of dentistry the United States Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Register in 1993, they said that the data doesn't show that we've got safety and they really have concerns about the excessive oral exposure in the drinking water. And then the NHS in England in 2000, the National Research Council in America in 2006, the Scientific Committee for Health and Environmental Research in the EU again, uh, in this century, have complained there's insufficient scientific evidence to demonstrate that water fluoridation is safe. These are official requests, and nothing was done. Bureaucratic uh, stability and obfuscation, obfuscation, they just haven't done it. And for 50 years, you can say that public health authorities have pursued a policy of um, Population medication, and you've had this demonstrated to you yesterday, that this is medication. And they're using an industrial fluoride chemical with contaminants, and there's been no research to show what effect that could have on health. Now, I wasn't here yesterday when Dick Lan War from Ireland apparently gave a presentation um, by Skype, but I've been corresponding with him um, fairly recently, and this was his research paper. It's uh, 140 pages long with 400 references, and it was presented uh, in February of this year to the Republic of Ireland and the government, to EU and WHO. And very briefly, 
It looked at 28 different diseases and showed that in the Republic of Ireland, which had mandated fluoridation for 50 years, there was a statistically highly significant increase in these diseases, up to 470% increased incidence. It got diabetes, obesity, dementia, endocrine, mainly thyroid problems, rheumatoid osteoarthritis, chronic lung disease, and also SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, where New Zealand is actually higher, and uh, congenital abnormalities. Now, we've got exactly the same health problems in New Zealand, also in Australia and in America. Huge health costs that are continually climbing, and they are not present to anywhere near that extent in the unfluoridated countries. And this is what Declan War has done that should have been done um, in the past. I want to just look at one thing, because I've only got a few minutes, and this is not in his report because it, he's only found it recently and he's been corresponding with me about it. He looked at osteosarcoma. Now, I'm biased about osteosarcoma. It's a rare disease, fortunately. It kills young children, young boys, usually in their teens. We have about eight or nine a year. I personally have been involved with two teenage boys that died from osteosarcoma. Both of them were fluoridated, one at Mount Monganui before they stopped fluoridation and one at Fokotani. So I've seen this personally. We've got an incidence of male osteosarcoma that is higher in the fluoridated countries compared to the EU. More in males but in females. And this is a chart showing, this came out uh, in 2009, looking at the incidence, and there are two peaks. Um, there's one, the main one in young adolescents, and there's another peak later on in the senior citizens. And this is an overall one um, looking at countries. And um, what Declan War showed was that if you look at the fluoridated countries, this is America, there is the same peak, slightly higher in the younger age group, but there's another one. Whoops, let's go back. And another one in the older generation, which is quite considerable. We're looking here about four for the EU, and you're looking at uh, eight or so in America. Australia, it's worse. You're looking at a, a significant increase. It's, it's a very sensitive device, this. Um, you're looking at a far greater increase in Australia. Now, I contacted the health department statistics just a few days ago, to see what I could get about New Zealand figures. And I got figures for the older generation, which are comparable to here. I sent them over to Declan War and said, yes, we have got a peak, but it's not that much. And he emailed me back almost immediately to say, if you look at these figures, they're per million. In New Zealand, the statistics from the health department are per 100,000. So the New Zealand figure per million is actually higher than Australia. We've got, that's the Australian one, we've got a figure that's up here in the older generation. Now yesterday, an oncologist, Dr. Goodwin, showed you that we have about 22 deaths of cancer a day here in New Zealand. We have a high rate of cancer internationally. Hamilton has got about 4% of the population, I understand. And if my maths is right, based on osteosarcoma, this rare condition, you can expect that there will be at least one or two teenage boys 
that will die here in Hamilton over the next few days as a result of the fluoridation of this city. There will also be an equal number of elderly. And I think that it's about time that this practice was stopped because it's going to take a little while for that to clear. Um, it's all for the sake of one tooth. There's no question about that. Lifelong exposure to fluoridated water, you're going to save about one tooth. Is it worth it? I don't think so. Max Planck, the great German scientist, said that changes in science occur funeral by funeral. It takes about 50 years. We've got to wait for the professors and their students to die or at least retire. I think we've had this for 50 years. It's time to call it quits. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got no time for questions there, so thank you very much um, for that presentation. Now, the next um, presenter... Right. Our next uh, presenter is Eric Blankenville. I hope I've said that right. Come on up, Eric. Close enough. Councillors, we're going to try Paul Connett after Eric's uh, finished. So you've got 10 minutes, including questions. Eric? I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to um, speak with you on the fluoridation issue. Um, the first comment I would like to make is you're probably wondering to yourselves that you, know, you get elected to a council to manage the, the usual council affairs and here you are asked to make a decision of a medical nature um, which is going to be imposed upon all the citizens of your city. And naturally, when you're asked to do a thing like that, well, the first question is you will say is, well, who's asking me to do it? And it's the Ministry of Health. And you think to yourself, as we all would have a tendency to do well, they, they must know what they're talking about. Um, we should just really rubber stamp this, which is what's happened in the past. There was a, a very good uh, documentary that many of you may have seen in the last few years called Let Us Spray. And that was about the Ministry of Health's involvement in the regulation of 245T, which had a dioxin in it, which we now all know at any concentration is a mutagenic, causing birth defects. And, um, and that's exactly what happened, of course, in New Zealand in areas where there was high concentrations, and not even high concentrations, but where people used these sprays. And the role of the Ministry of Health in managing the, the public relations on that is very well documented in that documentary. And I'd just like to quote you one um, excerpt from a confidential memo to Cabinet when the Ministry of Health was finally forced to look into 245T. George Gere, the Minister of Health, wrote to Cabinet in this memo, the sole responsibility for the proposed committee is to allay public fears that 245T is responsible for abnormalities such as spina bifida. So th this was the final outcome of years of pressure f of New Zealand citizens asking the Ministry of Health, the, the officials who are paid to look after our health, to look into 245T dioxin. Their only agenda was to tell us that it was all right. And even when this all came out in a documentary, nothing was done, no consequences. This is what the Ministry of Health is capable of doing.
at that time, the acceptable level of concentration of dioxin in the spray was one part per million. That was set in 1970. It was set because the industry had managed to achieve one part per million. Prior to that, for the last 20 years, New Zealand was having two to 20 parts per million of this dioxin. And when industry could manage one part per million, the Ministry of Health said, well, one part per million is, is, is safe. And nothing would have happened if there hadn't have been public pressure, if there hadn't been protests. Uh, people like us standing before you now talking about fluoride. Very similar substance, also extremely toxic. Also with a history of being introduced into our water system at the suggestion of a uh, consultant who was charged with, what are we going to do with this fluoride? We can't dispose of it. It's too toxic to dispose of anywhere. And there was a mantra in industry where pollution is involved. And that mantra is, the solution to pollution is dilution. Diluted enough and we can, we can manage it. Now, they weren't allowed to pour it into the sea. That was illegal. So, let's link it to a health benefit and put it in the water. That is the history. That is the genesis of fluoridation in the United States. So just to go back to what happened with dioxin, because dioxin and fluoride are very similarly toxic substances. Every time that the pressure mounted and they had to look into it, they would respond by saying, no, it's perfectly safe, but we'll lower the threshold. So the threshold was lowered from 1970 to from one part per million uh, in 19... 80, I think it was, it was lowered to 0.1 part per million. So that's a tenfold decrease. The protests continued. The workers at the Ivan Watkinsdale plant were dying of cancer at an enormous rate. So they asked the Ministry of Health, can you look into our increased rates of cancer deaths? So this is their response to that request. Their response was, no useful purpose could be served by investigating this situation in depth. Massey University decided to do a study on it. Their findings were that depending on where you worked in the plant, your risk of dying of cancer was increased between 46% and 69% in the normal community. So then they set this, the safe level as I said, at point one, a tenfold drop. In the mid-1980s, New Zealand was now the last country in the world to allow the use of dioxin. It was banned in the United States in 1971. In the court cases that um, took place then, the New Zealand Ministry of Health sent their advisor to support the safety of dioxin for the chemical companies. But that still was not enough the Americans saw through it, they banned it in 1971. But we carried on. We actually then subsidised it to halve the price of it and increase the use of it. Then finally, in 1983, the pressure was so great that they had to do something. So what did they do? They, they didn't say it was unsafe, but they said, we'll lower, lower the level again. Another tenfold lowering of the level. That then lowered the level to a point where they couldn't make the pesticide anymore, so that they closed it down. My, my point is this. None of you here are doctors. None of you here are probably inclined to turn around to people and say, you must take this medicine or you must take that medicine. You've, you've done what we should be able to do, assume that if the Ministry of Health says it's good and we need it, then that must be true. Um, the, the pedigree of their actions in the past um, makes it clear that it's not safe to make that assumption. I'll, I need, I'll leave it at that. I have much more to tell you, but 10 minutes is a very short period of time. 
What I may just so, wrap up with. Um, there might be a couple of questions. Yeah. Okay. So you ready for those? Um, yes. Well, are, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, so that's what we're up to now. Um, I just just do have a couple. Um, yeah. uh, have you got some qualifications in, in science or something? Or no. No. Okay. Or medical. Well, I, I have qualifications in common sense. Yeah, no, no, I, I, was, yeah. I was just trying to understand if you had any if formal qualifications in science or medical. Stuff. Why is that important? It's not. I'm just checking because of the way your presentation is. I, I assumed that you did. That's okay. All. Yeah. And secondly, can you just, do you live in Hamilton? I do not live in Hamilton, Whereabouts no. do you live? I live in Auckland. Okay, yeah. all right. All right, I just want to check that. Thank you. Um, any other questions? My question. Yes. Dioxin and fluoride. Yes. You say they're similar compounds. Yes. Well, they're similar in their toxicity. toxicity. They're, they're both ranked as uh, of extremely high toxicity and you know, very difficult to dispose of them safely. So the difference now between our um, artificial fluoride and what we used to get, or what they used to put in, uh, the stuff that comes out the chimneys, has other toxins in it. Uh, have you seen uh, Hamilton's test on, on our water? I have not seen Hamilton's test on the water, no. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank All right. you very much. That, that okay, great. well, if I just have a minute left, I'd just like to wrap up with um, um, the previous speaker mentioned that one of the issues of fluoride on, on you is your um, impact on thyroid. Um, it's very interesting to note that doctors do use fluoride to inhibit thyroid activity. Um, so here's a list of the effects of, um, in, of underactive thyroid. Sorry, Eric, that's, no? your time's up. Right. Sorry, okay. We've really got to keep strictly to time. But we've got your written submission. And if there is any information that you want to leave with Jacob for councillors to read, please do that. Thank you. Okay, we're going to call in um, with Paul Connor. Um, just, um, just a little reminder for councillors, when you're asking questions, do make sure you've got the mic in front of you because it's not going to be picked up on the live stream unless you've got the mic in front of you to hear um, over the, the airwaves. Yes. So we've got Paul Connett from overseas. A few seconds to... Councillors, did you get the information about the, um, the DHB website? Up and going, yeah. So they've had, they've had problems with the website. So. Hello? Good evening. Hello.
Okay, I'm mindful that we're going to, you know, really do want to keep moving. So how are we going here? One more time? Okay. I do wonder whether um, we should record um, the conversation off-site and then replay it. I know that's difficult for questions, but... Um Hello. <laughs> can you hear me? I can, yes. Great. Please um, feel free to resume your presentation. We can hear you loud and clear. Can you just let them know that we did hear the beginning? Uh, thank you very much. We Good. Did, we did hear the first um, three minutes of okay. Presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, in science, it must always be entertained that an ugly fact can destroy a beautiful theory. Recently, there have been several ugly facts that destroy the claims that swallowing fluoride reduces tooth decay, and it is perfectly safe to do so. I would like to mention just two of those ugly facts. The first one is the admission by proponents, particularly the Center for Disease Control in the United States in 1999, that the predominant action of fluoride is topical, not systemic. Now, previously, they thought that the fluoride had to accumulate in the teeth before they were, had erupted, but now they say, no, the predominant action is on the surface of the tooth and not from inside the body. Once they admitted that, it should have been the end of fluoridation. It simply doesn't make sense to swallow fluoride when, if you want it, you can apply it directly to the teeth and spit it out. This way, you are reaching the target tissue while minimizing exposure to other tissues. And, of course, using this approach, you're not forcing it on people who don't want it, uh, retaining their freedom of choice. The second ugly fact is the meta-analysis of IQ studies published by a team from Harvard University in July of 2012. I personally have been warning about this, the possibility that fluoride damaged the brain since 19... 96, and it was important that this team from Harvard has essentially validated our concerns. They looked at 27 studies which compared the IQ of children in high fluoride villages, uh, levels in villages with high fluoride levels in the water versus villages with low levels. And in 26 of these studies, they found a lowering of IQ with an average of seven IQ points. Now, admittedly, there were some weaknesses in some of the studies, but the overall um, consistency of these results was remarkable. Proponents have claimed that this only occurred for high concentrations, uh, that the, the, where this lowering occurred is only with very high concentrations, but that's simply not true. Uh, and it also indicates that they don't understand uh, the difference between concentration and dose. Uh, first of all, um, they found at least eight of these studies the concentration in the high fluoride village where the IQ was lowered was lower than three parts per million. And another study found a threshold at 1.9 part, 1 parts per million. And another found an effect at 0.91 parts per million. So none of these studies at these levels provide an adequate margin of safety to protect all of New Zealand's children against the range of dose that you can anticipate in fluoridated communities. Some children drink a lot of water. Some children get fluoride from other sources. And nor does it protect against the large range of sensitivity that you could expect in any large population. And we usually use, for this purpose, a margin of safety of 10. That is absolutely standard unless you're dealing with a very, uh, the study group is a very large population, which it was not in these cases. At the end of the day, if you decide counselors to continue with fluoridation, you need to be able, in my view, to justify forcing it on people that don't want it. I don't know how you can do that, but at least in your own mind, you should be able to justify that. And secondly, you should be able to convince yourself that the benefits are large. I don't see those large benefits. We wrote three chapters in our book, and in the large studies, you do not see a huge difference in tooth decay between children who've grown up in fluoridated and or non-fluoridated communities. 
And you need to be able to convince yourself that the risks to the brain, the bone, the thyroid gland, and the other risks like osteosarcoma, all of which are documented in the National Research Council report of 2006, you have to convince yourself that you can safely ignore all those, um, all those findings in the scientific literature. Uh, in my view, it is not sufficient to accept, accept second-hand endorsements from other agencies, no matter how prestigious they may be. Um, this is essentially hearsay evidence if you haven't yourself looked at the primary evidence. And I should point out that none of the people that are, that are urging you to continue fluoridation accept any liability for any harm caused. They only give you advice. They do not provide any indemnity against harm, which includes the Ministry of Health. You are the only ones who can be held responsible if there's any legal action in the future. It's entirely on your shoulders. And you better, I think, be absolutely certain of the things I've said, that you can justify forcing it on people that don't want it, that you, you're cons absolutely convinced that the benefits are large and the risks are, are negligible. Uh, I think it's particularly dubious taking second-hand advice from agencies like the Ministry of Health that weren't able to provide a written response to our book and who claim safety even though they cannot point to any health study actually carried out in New Zealand to support their claims. And I think it's equally dubious to accept the word of district health boards who essentially are instructed to support Ministry of Health policies. That's just a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's equally dubious to accept the exaggerated claims of other fluoridation promoters who have been unwilling to defend their position in open public debate with me, even though I offered to debate any pro-fluoridation dentist, doctor, scientist, or public health official in my last visit to New Zealand in March. Uh, I, I ask you, are you comfortable accepting the advice of those who cannot or will not defend their position in open public debate. Um, I would also suggest to you that if you stop fluoridation, you are depriving no one of fluoride because if they want the fluoride, they can use fluoridated toothpaste. And if there's any concern about low-income families, then that's where the money that you save from the, the fluoridation chemicals could be spent on providing free toothbrushes, free toothpaste, and, and better education to low-income families. Now, my final recommendation before I entertain some questions, if we've got any time left, is my, my recommendation is a fairly conservative one. I recommend, well, obviously I'd hope that you would stop fluoridation immediately, but here's a conservative uh, suggestion. I recommend that you hold fluoridation until such time as the Ministry of Health can successfully rebut all the arguments presented in our book. Uh, not their solo arguments, that they, they, they provide answers to their own questions. Let them rebut all the carefully constructed arguments in our book, which is backed up with 80 pages of references to the scientific literature. I'm surprised they haven't done that, but if you, you make that a requirement, and if they're ever going to do it, they're going to do it then, because they'll need to do that if you want to start fluoridation again. And I think a second requirement is that the promoters must find somebody from either a dental organization, a medical organization, or a public health organization that will have the courage of their convictions and debate me in an open public debate. And if you can find some, some, such a person, I will willingly come back to New Zealand and, and to do that. So now I'm, I'm ready for questions if we've got any time left. Right, councillors. Questions to be relayed through you, Jacob. Is that right? Yeah. So are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Connett, and thank you for your patience while we grappled with technology. Um, you say that we, sh as councillors, we should not accept endorsements from other agencies. If the advice from other agencies was to stop fluoridation, should we ignore that also? Well, yes, I think there's a... There's a can I answer? Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a world of difference. I think uh, to proceed with this, you have to have total confidence. Um, 
uh, to stop it. I don't think you need... It's, it's rather... I always use this analogy. I think fluoridation is like building a dam above a village. Um, those who build the dam must be absolutely confident and expertise, have expertise on every aspect of dam safety, whereas an individual that um, looks at the dam, maybe as a peasant farmer, and looks at the dam, or he has some experience of the soil structure under the dam because of his farming, says, I think there's a weakness here and this dam could break. Um, that, that single piece of testimony could be sufficient to stop that dam from being built. You, you, you have to be able to answer every single scientific study that suggests there may be harm here. And I do not see that the promoters of fluoridation have done that. Instead, they try to, to uh, nitpick the methodology of studies that, they, that uh, suggest harm, and they show no indication, not only in, in New Zealand, but any other fluoridated country, of attempting to reproduce the studies that have ha found harm elsewhere. Um, I find that preposterous. If, if their understanding of epidemiology is so good, why aren't they using the superior understanding and doing their own epidemiological studies to check these IQ studies out, check out oh, the yeah, thyroid yeah, studies, yeah. check out the... Right, so um, I'm having Sorry? a couple of questions. We've just got time for one more question. Is that you, Angela? I hope so. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Connett, it's Angela O'Leary here. Thank you for um, phoning in from such a long way away. Um, just in your written submission, um, I'm interested in you, um, in your support of actually chewing gum. You're saying that um, it's better to encourage the use of fluoride toothpaste and mints containing the sugar xylitol. Is that, um, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in that. Are you, are you saying that... Uh, if there was some kind of a campaign, perhaps some kind of a health campaign where we distributed fluoride-based toothpaste and gum containing xylitol, that that would uh, mitigate the effects of what the other, the other proponents are saying? Yes. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I didn't hear all your question clearly, but let me assume that I understand. Uh, the first point is yes. If it's a straight choice between putting fluoride in the water or using fluoridated toothpaste, I think the decision is, is very simple. Obviously, using fluoridated toothpaste minimizes exposure to other tissues, doesn't eliminate it completely, and, and it also solves the ethical problem of not forcing it on other people. So, but I should point out, in the last 17 years, I personally have not used fluoridated toothpaste, and I would prefer to see uh, the use of xylitol in toothpaste because xylitol is a natural sugar. We produce it in our own bodies, so we can be pretty certain it's very safe. And what it does, it, it prevents the bacteria that cause tooth decay um, from sticking to the teeth. And if those bacteria can't stick to the teeth, they can't survive and they wither away. And not only does the use of xylitol protect the mother, but it also protects the baby because the the mother can spread the bacteria to the baby by licking the teeth or um, a kissing. And if the mother's protecting her oral cavity with xylitol, she will also protect the baby. There's nothing new with xylitol. We've be, they've used it in Scandinavia and Japan for over 30 years. And we have experiments going on in this country where we're using uh, xylitol mints in schools in low-income areas. We might just have to end it there. Thank you very much. Okay. And, um Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, very much. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Hey, thanks for talking that up. That was very good. So the next speaker is uh, Bessie Armour. Have we got Bessie here? Mm. Morning, Bessie. Ten minutes, including questions, thanks. Good morning, thank you. I've lived in Hamilton since my birth. I had a fairly healthy childhood with no medication apart from the odd Aspro. When I started work, any three-day absence required a doctor's certificate. I didn't require much medication, but soon found that any can have side effects. 
The 1950s were early days for antibiotics, and my first experience of antibiotic produced a serious side effect worse than the illness being treated. A prescribed ointment brought my skin out in a rash. A cough syrup caused a weird giddiness. Latest from America was said of a prescribed hormone drug, which did nothing but give me nightmares. Years later, that particular drug was withdrawn from use because of its damage to teenage girls whose mother had taken it when pregnant. One day in our staff room, while I was still working, a fellow worker was most excited about a wonderful sleeping aid she'd discovered and encouraged me and others to use it. It so happened that at that time, I was in the early stages of my first pregnancy. My husband has been forever grateful that I did not follow that woman's advice, for her ideal sleeping aid was none other than thalidomide. When it was proposed to fluoridate Hamilton's water, my unhappy experiences with the little medication I'd had inspired me to write my first ever letter to the editor of the Waikato Times, voicing objection to what I saw as mass medication. I wrote two letters, in fact, above the pseudonym Witch's Brew. You could use a pseudonym in those days. Dr. Dennis Rogers was mayor at the time. I had great respect for him and was sure his common sense would keep him from approving such a stupid notion and was indeed surprised and disappointed when he went along with it. So fluoridation came into Hamilton's water in the mid-60s. About 10 years before, an interesting and outspoken woman doctor and one of New Zealand's earliest women, earliest women doctors was overseas having alternative treatment for her own cancer when, as a result, she claimed to have found a cure for the disease. This was publicly announced in New Zealand where it's illegal to say such a thing. On her return to New Zealand, she was arrested at Christchurch Airport as she got off the plane and was prosecuted for making such a statement. The court case was published in, news in newspapers throughout the country. My father read the case and said to me, if you ever get cancer, that's the person to go to. Dr. Eva Hill was not young. I knew her cancer cure was to do with diet, and I was most curious to find out before she died what it was, thinking if any diet can cure cancer, surely, even better, such a diet may prevent cancer. In 1970, my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer and had only weeks to live. At the same time, I also had a growth of my own that I was not happy about. It was time for me to find out what this woman advocated if it was not already too late. So I searched out and phoned Dr. Eva Hill in Auckland. When she knew I was ringing from Hamilton, the first thing she said to me was, whatever you do, don't drink Hamilton's water. She was an avid opponent of fluoridation and had moved to the outskirts of Auckland to escape the fluoridated water. Her next sentence to me was, the only cure for cancer is to eat raw food for at least two years. My heart sank. That sounded to me like a life sentence. In fact, it is a life sentence in contrast to the death sentence of the disease. She later visited us in Hamilton and shared her advice in a 30-minute consultation. Another of her strong statements was, eat your food the way God made it for you, not the way man has mucked it up. I began her recommendations on myself and our sickly seven-year-old who had been on non-stop medication for the previous six months. It was a stressful time for my father was dying. After his funeral, I said to my husband, Preparing two different types of food is rather difficult. How about we give this raw food a 10-day trial with the whole family? He had listened to Dr. Hill's interview and agreed to try it. So for 10 days, my husband and I and our children ate totally, strictly, only raw food. The improvement in that brief time was impressive. My husband was happy. He lost weight without having to run around the block. The children's tummies all tightened up, which was puzzling, until I recognised the return of strong muscle tone they'd each had as breastfed babies and had since lost. Dr. Eva Hill had mentioned muscle tone. It dawned on me we were onto a good thing. As a result of that ultra-strict 10-day trial, 
We changed our family's food in a major way. Today, my husband and I still basically eat raw fruit and vegetables and some cooked. Occasionally, we indulge in other food. One of the first things we did was install a water tank, and for the past 43 years, we have used only rainwater, rainwater for drinking and cooking. For probably a good 20 years, the family drank it unboiled. Whatever washed into the tank from the roof didn't, see, didn't, didn't seem to bother anyone. One day I heard a cat on the roof and decided from then on to boil it. When we changed our food in 1970, we had four young children. Another was born about a year later, so from conception he was brought up on a majority of raw food. I asked him recently about a visit he paid to the dentist last year after not seeing one for 10 years. The dentist did one small filling and said everything was fine. He has six small fillings total. I asked him, had he drunk rainwater when he was growing up or tap water? He replied, only rainwater. He cleaned his teeth with tap water, but that was probably not very often. At no time did he see a doctor for any illness during the 20 years he lived under our care. Now, maybe I could stand for council on a platform advocating raw food diet for all residents of Hamilton. I could try, if elected, to totally ban the sale of cooking equipment, would close all fast food outlets, prohibit the sale in Hamilton of any cooked or processed food, with the possible exception of wholemeal bread, would reduce the amount of pasteurised milk coming into the city, for pasteurised milk is cooked. Dr Eberhill said, if you must drink milk, drink only raw milk from a healthy animal. I am certain the health of Hamilton's citizens would improve beyond belief. Waikato Hospital would hopefully be reduced to a fraction of its size, and many GPs, after twiddling their thumbs, would seek work elsewhere. How could I justify such a stance? Well, I personally have proved that this diet works, having seen the results on two adults and five children over more than 20 years. And because of that, I can say I know what's good for you and I know it works. I know if I were to stand for council on such a platform, I probably wouldn't get a single vote, not even from my husband who enjoys getting out of his armchair to fix a toaster if someone brings one along. It's an extreme view and I have no intention of forcing my p opinion on anyone, but I see a similarity in the placing of fluoride in the public water supply, a policy of, we know what's good for you, so let's improve the population's health, in this case teeth, through the city's water. My stand today is that I am opposed to the use of fluoride in the public water supply. I have no objection to the water's chemical purification, but am strongly opposed to adding fluoride as mass medication and being involved in paying for it as well. Sure, we currently drink rainwater in our home, but should we move into a retirement village or rest home, we will be obliged to consume fluoridated water. In the meantime, I am most thankful to have lived far longer than I ever expected. My husband and I and our children, brought up mostly on raw food and without fluoride, have enjoyed a blessed and healthy life. I commend to you again Dr. Eva Hill's dictum. Take your food and your water the way God made it, not the way man's mucked it up. Thank you. Done, BC. Thank you. Do you mind if I ask you a question of a personal nature? How old are you? And you don't have to answer it. <laughs> uh, my children found I didn't like answering that question, but I am 79. Thank you very much for coming along. Well done. All right. Next speaker, uh, Lois. Lois. Good morning, Lois. For 10 minutes, including questions. Good morning, councillors, Mayor, committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My speech is more like a personal reflection. Hydrofluorosilicic acid. I was glad that the vet had trouble saying that word too. It's hard to pronounce, and it's even more difficult to swallow. Fluoride added to the water is not the same as fluorine naturally occurring in the soil. 
So we are lacking fluorine in the soil. Why would we put acid in the water? I graduated as a school dental nurse in 1969, and we were taught during our training that diet, oral hygiene, and fluoride went hand in hand in oral health. One of my dental training officers was the late Mr. John Cahoon. And it is interesting to note that Mr. Cahoon on retirement went on to study, both here and overseas, the effects of fluoride. And after much study, he became a prominent opponent of fluoridation. In fact, in 1984, <coughs> excuse me, 1985, 1987, he found no difference in tooth decay between fluoridated and non-fluoridated communities in New Zealand. I was aware as a young dental nurse that there were opponents to fluoridation, but they were dismissed as mostly American crackpots. And we we're only talking about one part per million parts of water. How could this possibly be harmful as these cranks are suggesting? I even argued with the late Dr. Eva Hill at a public meeting in Te Aumutu over 30 years ago, she being against and me for. We were taught in dental school simply that this addition of fluoride, we certainly never heard of hydrofluorosyrilic acid, was an amazingly simple answer to prevention of tooth decay. And we did not need to question the matter. Indeed, much later in my life, I queried my dental nurse inspector, the late Miss Jean Bryant, about her thoughts on fluoride. And her answer was, Oh, well, we were taught not to question. The reason I asked her her thoughts was because I had misgivings. I'd long since given up fluoridated toothpaste. I drank non-fluoridated water and, I start, and started questioning water fluoridation when so many countries in the world had ceased the practice due to general health concerns from ingestion of fluoride. Dental nurses loved seeing charts, dental charts, with the word fluoride written boldly at the top. But there were a number of occasions when in the secondary tooth of an 11 or 12 year old, there was the odd catch on the top of the enamel, a little pit, a little catch. And when drilled, there was actually a bog in the dentine below, below the enamel. Hmm, a little question mark here, what was going on? What we did not like seeing written at the top of our charts was honey on a dummy. Believe me, that was when you wanted the mother in the chair, not the small child with a mouthful of decaying teeth. Of course, this is about health education. One school I worked in, as I was preparing my steriliser and instruments, I looked out the window before 9am, children eating donuts. They were able to buy them outside the school gate by the donut man. And after a week, I complained to the headmaster. And within a short time, the donut man no longer visited before school. Health education. Getting back to oral hygiene and diet, it seems to me that these are forgotten. Fluoride is the magic. No, it's not. Sugary juices and fizzy drinks are consumed with wild abandon. Processed foods and sugar-laden foods have much to answer for. It's about education. No one is taking away the choice. There are fluoride tablets, fluoride toothpaste, topical application of fluoride by a dental health professional, dentist, which I have heard is considered the most effective fluoride treatment. Acid in our water has no place. And consider this, a bottle-fed baby consumes the equivalent of a 90 kilo person if fluoridated water is used to mix formula. And why wouldn't professionals from the Otago Dental School meet with Dr. Paul Connett and discuss the topic when he was here in March? There is a saying, he who never changes his mind has learned nothing. Thank you. Any questions for Lois? Pardon? I'm just checking if there's any questions, Lois. Oh, sorry. Yes, Margaret. Yes. Um, thank you, Lois. I'm interested in uh, your um, tenure as a dental nurse at school, and it may be difficult for you to answer, but 
Do you know what the effect of removal of dental nurses had on um, children's dental health? Well, we haven't removed dental nurses. We've got dental therapists who still continue to visit the schools. What they did do was take away um, the uh, the job of the dental nurses to do dental health in the classrooms, which I always thought was a, um, a very important part from the dental nurses, mainly from the point of view that uh, the dental nurses will generally we were known as the, um, what was it? Um, <laughs> well, in one school I was known as the Russian Front. Um, uh, murder House, that's right, I, I had forgotten. Uh, thank you. Um, the Murder House. And so it was one way of going and sitting down at the level of the children and talking to them about dental health. And, we, and I, that was sort of taken over, I think, by the, um, the, the teachers. But the dental nurses haven't been removed. They are still in the schools in the mobile caravans. The, same the dental therapists. In the same numbers that they were? I understood there used to be a dental nurse at every, at every school. Yes, I but that, that's not we the used now. to treat approximately 500 children in a year, seeing them twice a year. I believe the therapists now um, would see double that number of children. I mean, their, their equipment has improved. They're using the high-speed drills. They've got X-ray machines. Um, th everything has improved so much that, of course, I think they're still seeing. Um, we did hear yesterday um, from, I think it was Sue McFarlane, gave us the stats and information. Yes, on that. and yeah. dental treatment is still free for children up till mm. the time they leave school. I mean, mm. we haven't lost uh, all of that. I'm, I'm talking about our education. We should be educated that we don't rely on fluoride to fix okay. teeth. Okay. That's Thank my you. point. It's about education, right from ground level, sure. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lois, for your presentation. You. Very good. Now, we've got um, Victoria West. Victoria West. Morning, Victoria. So you've got 10 minutes of closing questions. Thank you. I don't have a technical background. I'm, I am a graduate from university, so I do have a degree of critical reasoning skills. I am a mother of two beautiful children. I've done my reading, and I've, from what I've found of fluoride, I, I struggle every day knowing that I'm bathing my children in it and giving it to them in their drinking water, knowing what it does. I'm nervous, I'm not a public speaker. Okay, and we're really interested in hearing what people have to say. But they're yeah. all naked. No. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I wanted to keep it simple so what I did I, I went to the dictionary I looked up fluoride what's the definition of fluoride and I took this definition from the Funk and Wagnalls Standard Dictionary published in New York in 1963 fluoride a binary compound of fluorine and another element okay so what's fluorine Fluorine, a pale, greenish-yellow, intensely pungent and corrosive gaseous element belonging to the halogen group. It's among the most chemically active and of the elements. Soluble fluorides, such as hydrofluorosilic acid, are poisonous. Full stop. I'm aware that hydrofluorosilic acid has a hazardous rating, hazardous substance rating and is classed as a poison in New Zealand and in other countries around the world. And as such, it is handled with extreme caution. It is labelled with hazardous substance labels and transported in hazardous substance vehicles. I want to know why we have a poison in our drinking water for our children for our elderly, let alone the rest of us. 
As counsellors, you're sitting in a position of power. You have the power to remove this, and with, with that position of power comes a moral obligation for the people that you represent. In the, uh, in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Article 25, it states that It states that everybody has the right to a standard of living for the health and well-being of himself and his family. This includes food and water. We shouldn't have to put up with poison, a poisonous substance in our water. And I'm here on behalf of my family and my children to uphold that right and to speak on behalf of my children. We're now living in a system of accountability and when you have adequate information and you know better and you choose to act outside of that, you are, are held accountable for your actions and the ramifications of those actions and choices. And I'm asking you today, please, please, you've got the knowledge, you've got that information. Please use your position of power to do the right thing. That's all I have to say. Very good. You got through that really well, Victoria. Now just wait there because we're going to have some questions. You can just take a deep breath and relax now. Yes. Are there any questions? No. So there's no questions. But you know what? I think you. I think you made your point really clearly. I think we definitely got the message you wanted to send us, and we've got your written submission here as well. Thank so thank you. you very much for doing that and coming along. Well done, you. Thank you. Okay, the next person we've got is Cynthia Campbell, and I think, Cynthia, you're going to say something to us in one minute. You're going to make one point in one minute. Go for it. My name's Cynthia Campbell, and I'm here on behalf of myself and my family too, and I just wish to say that I'm against fluoriding our water. I think it's... Um, well, I'm not happy being medicated against my will, and I'd like it to be stopped. Thank you. Now, the next um, presenter is um, Brent Phillips. And so, Brent, you have um, 10 minutes, including questions. Technology ready. I'd just like to start off saying thank you to Mayor and Councillors for all coming along and giving us as Hamiltonians this opportunity to talk about this issue. Um, a little introduction to myself. <coughs> I don't have a medical background. My background well, and my profession at the moment is as a teacher here at Wintec in electrical engineering and I've been trying to use some of my spare time to do a bit of research about this fluoride issue. One of them Main things that was uh, one of the focuses of my written submission, which I'd like to focus on in my talk today, is about the ethics of fluoridation. And it was quite coincidental that yesterday here at Wintech we had a talk mostly about ethics from the chief executive of the Institute of Professional Engineers of New Zealand. He was talking to the students and also myself as a staff member went along to hear him talking about why ethics was such an important part of any profession. One of the key points that he made was that ethics is always leading ahead of what the requirements of the law are. So at the moment, requirements of the law allow fluoridation of water, but I ask all of you, and I ask you to consider very carefully about what are your ethical principles that you're acting by, and the stakeholders that are involved in this, Hamiltonian residents and visitors to Hamilton, what do they expect of you? This can be a difficult question to answer, but I think it's a very important question. So as a little bit of background to help us think about why this ethical question is so important, 
we need to know why the fluoride is actually there in the first place. Or well, hydrofluorosilic acid, so fluoride and a bunch of other chemicals. According to the DHB, it's in there to protect our teeth. That's a direct quote from their website, and I'm sure we've heard earlier in their presentations. And it's there specifically to treat a disease, and that's a very important point. So just to check that this is a correct definition, I've gone to the Oxford English Dictionary, and we can see that, yes, diseases are something that produces specific symptoms or affects a specific location, and it's not a result of physical injury. So yeah, tooth decay affects specifically your teeth, it's not a result of injury. So it affects this definition of a disease. And then following on to medication, what comes naturally next after disease for many of us. So we're using some type of drug or other form and it's treating the specific disease. And from the thing that we just saw from the Waikato District Health Board, fluoride is there to treat the disease of tooth decay. So this definitions are all working out nicely so far. Another one from the New Zealand Medicine Acts also follows along the same sort of principles where the medicine is defined, therapeutic purpose for a medicine is being defined and this all seems to tie in with fluoride, linking up with tooth decay. But the important thing that comes next is what's required by the New Zealand Health and Disability Commissioner. These are the people that set the rules for how medical professionals should act. And given that this is a medical issue, and you are all responsible for deciding on a medical issue, I think this is pertinent that we refer to the rules that are set out for those who are making decisions on medical practices. There's 10 fundamental rights for anyone receiving treatments, and the one that I think in this case is very important, and as others have mentioned, is the right to informed consent. Anyone who is receiving this treatment has the right to say no whenever they want to. And that's the big problem that I see for water fluoridation. It's a medicine that's being put in our water to treat the disease of tooth decay, but we don't have the right to say no, no to it. So I ask each of you to look very closely at yourselves and say, what is important to me? What is my ethical standards? Look at everybody in this room, everybody that you walk past on the street in Hamilton, or your family and friends. Can I force this onto somebody else? We should have the choice. I'm happy if somebody wants to take fluoride, they can go for it. I don't recommend it, but if they want to have it, they can go for it. Personally, I want the right to say no. I'm sure you're all familiar with the code of conduct that councillors and council employees are obliged to follow. So there's some points that I've taken out from that that hopefully remind you of your obligations. And the issue here is that it's mandatory fluoridation. There's no voluntary aspect in it at all. Fluoride's in there to treat disease. It's there for a medicine. And if we're receiving a medicine, we have the right to decline that. As counsellors, you are elected and obliged to act in an ethical manner. And it's up to each of you to decide how important to me is it to act ethically. Where do I draw the line? I need to see what are the risks and do the, how do things balance out? We've seen in the past things that have been acceptable and then have been ruled as being unacceptable by society and legally unacceptable. But the ethics of these issues always lead ahead of the legal requirements. So that's what I'm asking you today, to think about your own ethics for mandatory fluoridation. The law hasn't caught up to what people are asking for, but the ethics should be leading the law. So I ask all of you today to think and to look in the eye, everybody that you see in Hamilton, everybody that visits Hamilton, do we have the right to force them to take fluoride as a medication for tooth decay? Thank you. Do you have any questions? Okay. Yes, Councillor Hamilton. The Microphone. DH Sorry. <laughs> the DHB has suggested that the low dose is not a medicine because of it being a low dose. 
What is your response? My response to that would be, what is the purpose of the fluoride being in the water in the first place? And the DHB has put on their website, they've been promoting fluoride is there to treat the disease of tooth decay. And by the pure definitions from the Oxford English Dictionary, from the Medicines Act, anything, any substance or any other treatment that is intended directly to treat a disease means that that substance is a medicine, is a medical treatment. And if we are looking at a medical treatment, then medical ethics should apply. Thank, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Brent, for your okay. submission. Thank you, Councillors. Okay. Right, so we're now at morning tea break, and uh, we will be returning at 10.55? Um, 10.55, okay.